The dying embers of the domestic season were in the last week of September. There's still a bit of cricket to come. One round of championship games to complete and three ODIs. So this week's Sky Cricket podcast is being recorded the day before the Durham ODI. That's the third of fifth uh, and it'll probably go out on the morning of that game. Um, Nashi will be up in Durham. I won't be because I've just sat watching the rain for two days in Trent what Bridge. A grip. What a grim couple of days you've had. Ah, oh, Trent Bridge oh. is one of the great grounds in the world, but not for the last two days by the looks of it. <laughs> well, A, the weather was abominable. And B, of course, Kensian, the, the rain day being Monday and, and the forecast being equally awful, awful to Sunday, everybody just left. There are about 200 people in the ground today. There are as many stewards and ground staff uh, as supporters, which was a shame because, uh, as you will remember, because well, Lancashire turned over your Essex in good style yeah. one year at Lords in about 1997, if I remember. <laughs> that was one of the great uh, occasions of the domestic calendar, no longer, sadly. But well done to Glamorgan. Um, let's just chat about the ODIs, because England are 2-0 down going into this third one uh, in Durham, and they've been well beaten in both. They have. I mean, you know, you are talking about the world champions, and you are talking about a side that has now won... 14 on the bounce. So they are a seriously good side, even when they leave people out. Hazelwood Stark didn't play the first one. Cummins hasn't come over because he's prepping for uh, India, going over to Australia and getting ready for that. So they are a very good side. And England are inexperienced at this level in 50 over cricket in particular. I think Adil Rashid, especially with the bat, Adil Rashid, I think is their leading run getter in this format in the squad. So it shows how inexperienced they are. And they've shown that inexperience in, in the first two games, really. Uh, walloped in the first one. I wasn't at the second one. You did the second one. And I thought England had their chances in their second one. They could have been a bit more switched on. Um, I just guess it's that mindset again, and we've talked about it a lot, when you're resetting. And you've got to remember this is a reset. So do you look to just try and win games or do you try and get that mindset that Owen Morgan instilled in that side when he took over after 2015, when he sort of said, right, we're going to go, you know, we're going to give it absolutely, we're going to go hard in the power play. We're going to go hard for 50 overs. Um, but he had a side to do it and he had an experienced side to do that. Um, so, yeah, I think England have come up a little bit short, especially with the bat. I think at times they could have been a bit smarter in that second game. We'll see in the next three games if they can have that carefree attitude, but just be a bit smarter with the bat. Do you agree or do you see it differently? Um, well, it's interesting though that I think that they are inexperienced at this level, at ODI international level, and therefore some patience is required. No question about that. But I wondered, I mean, it, you know, a bit of the conversation is about how inexperienced some of the players are at 50 over level as well. If you took Jordan Cox, for example, who hasn't played in either of the games yet, he may make his. He may play in any of the last three. He's only played, I think, four list day games domestically. And because of how the structure is in England at the moment, so the 100 dominates August and the 50 over comp is played underneath it, which is like a bit of a development comp now. You know, I've just seen the final where Somerset, you know, missed seven players uh, for the 100. And so they just played the, the players that had got them to the final. What it means is in English cricket, there's a lot of very young kids who are like between second 11 and first 11 status at first class level they're getting a lot of exposure in 50 over cricket but the better younger players because they're in demand for the 100 franchises and Jordan Cox would be one of those they actually don't get the opportunity to play 50 over cricket at all and the question is and it's something that's been raised before is how relevant is 50 over cricket. There is a feeling among some people, I'm not sure I necessarily agree, actually. There is a feeling among some people that if you have test cricket, you play test cricket, long form cricket, first class cricket, and you play T T20 cricket, short form cricket, then 50 over cricket should look after itself. Now, it, the proof will be in the pudding eventually because we'll see how England go. But I do think 50 over cricket has a particular rhythm of its own. And if it, it's not just a T20 game that's a bit longer. I think you can get yourself in trouble that way because if you look at Australia's attack, at the moment, Stark, Hazelwood, 
that that's closer to a test match attack or it is a test match attack. So if you're going to just play it as an almost elongated T20 game, you know, you can get yourself into trouble. It's only two games in, but I don't think England have been very good with the bat in either, actually. They're in a very good position in the game you did uh, when Duckett and Jacks were going well, and they just didn't bat very well at all in the second. Um, hopefully we'll get to see. The flip side to all that, and I agree with it, um, is that people will argue, you know, how much cricket, 50 over cricket, did Virat Kohli play when he got in the India side or Rohit Sharma? Well, or no, that's, that's a good point. I would say Virat Kohli's played no domestic 50 over cricket since he's become an international cricketer. But there, so may, have been, a bit before. Yeah. there may have been a bit before. And in fact, you know, for England's World Cup winning squad, in fact, I, I think I'm right in saying at one point, you know, we were playing 40 over cricket and a lot of their experiences were in 40 over cricket, not necessarily 50 over cricket. We'll wait and see, I, but w- would think, you agree but, that 50 over cricket has a particular rhythm of its own? Yeah, it's not I, just a longer T20 game, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you have to be a bit smarter than that because yeah, absolutely. You know, the game will, yeah. will ebb and flow a bit, especially with it, like you mentioned, the quality of attack in the opposition. Definitely, you, you know, the other thing it shows is I still think because of that, you do need a certain type of player, and they are missing. Three serious white ball players in yeah. Stokes, Butler, and in particular, I think Joe Root, who has been, yeah. I think, rested is the word for this series because of what he's got ahead and what he's had behind him. But I do think it shows the quality of someone like Joe Root for the very reason you give. He gets the tempo of 50 over. He gets the tempo of any cricket, really. So I think it shows that even with youngsters, I don't want to go down that, you never win anything with youngsters line. Yeah. I do think you need that experienced batter to, to, to bat through, really. I think, and Root is that man. So you're off up to your uh, old uni to, to, tonight, yeah. then, tomorrow. What's the yeah. forecast like up at Durham? It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's not when too wet. Up, when you when, when yeah. you taking your daughter up? She goes. She goes Saturday. Uh, I'm not going because I'll be I'll be going to Bristol. So she's going up with Mum on Saturday. I did offer. I said, "You want to come up Tuesday with me on the train, and you can hang around Durham while I'm at Chester Street." And she just went, "I'm not going to Durham with me dad on the train. I'll go with Mum." So um, no, yeah. So uh, looking forward to it, actually um, up and down. Um, it's their it's their first game, isn't it? Up there this summer up in Durham. So I hope England. I hope England put on a show. So, um, you know, they'll be they'll spend their hard-earned cash. I think ticket sales are pretty good, and I just hope England put on a show for them. Um, so, other than that, the domestic season is, is winding to a close, really. Um, we haven't done a pod since the Blast Finals Day, actually, which I was at. Um, and it was good to see Gloucestershire go well. Very, played in a very, under Mark Elaine's leadership, of course, as coach. Played a very similar style of cricket to the one you will remember when Mark was a player there, kind of really tigerish fielding and canny bowling and the pitch, you know, was almost like it was at Bristol in the old days, a slightly holding pitch. And I bumped into Sid Lawrence. We put out a very short film uh, about Sid on the day and his devastating diagnosis of, of motor neuron disease. So I popped over to see him between semifinals and, of course, a devastating thing for him and his family but good to see that his spirit uh, was still intact he's got a great memory actually he me and him him and me were on the a tour to zimbabwe and kenya when you were fending it off your nose in the caribbean <laughs> um, and he was reminding me about all manner of stuff that i'd forgotten about on that trip um, so it was great to see him and his spirit intact and and fingers crossed you know that for him um and well, what, did you, what did you make what did you make of finals day in general I, I mean is it still you know the highlight of the domestic calendar would you say i mean it seems to well, be good certainly uh, it's certainly taken over from the 50 over final which we just talked about and which <laughs> yeah. the morgan won and which of course flipped because back in the day the 50 over lords final was the showpiece occasion but of course there were two in back in the day when we played we had a 50 over final and a 60 over knockout uh, final um, yeah, it was a it was a full house. It was a raucous atmosphere as ever. Um, I, I I wonder sometimes whether clubs wouldn't prefer a, a home semi final um, to have a more partisan crowd. Um, but it's just become a fixture in the calendar, hasn't it? Um, and Gloucestershire were very 
very worthy winners, I have to say. They played terrific cricket on and the night. In all, in all, all three knockout games, they yeah. were convincing winners. They didn't just creep yeah. over the line. They were convincing win winners and worthy winners. And like you say, um, you know, small stuff, but for Sid Lawrence, what, watching James Bracey hand him over that trophy yeah. or whatever um, was yeah, a very, very poignant moment. moment. It was, was definitely. Um, so Gloucestershire, the Blast, Glamorgan, the Metro Bank, um, Somerset challenging in all three competitions, but no silverware for them, uh, of course, because they didn't quite manage to catch Surrey uh, in the championship. Um, and our guest this week on the Sky Cricket Podcast is a championship winner. We are blessed with the presence of the vicar on this week's Sky Cricket Podcast, the vicar of Sibley, Dom Sibley. Welcome and congratulations, first of all. No doubt you've been painting South London red the last three nights celebrating. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a tough, tough day also. Yesterday was, uh, um, yeah, it was a tough day and today been back in uh, back in the ground sorting out the uh, change room. So, yeah, seeing a few faces and uh, a few broken men flying around. <laughs> well, it's an incredible achievement. Three successive championships, which hasn't been done since the late 1960s when Yorkshire did it. I mean, it's the oldest cliche in the book that says it's hard to win a, the first championship, harder still to win the second. So when you've got a target on your back, you know, trying to win a third, um, it really is an incredible achievement. What what have been the particular challenges this year? Um, I think, obviously, with the squad that we have, guys going off to play for England, um, you know, obviously, Smithy um, and Gus have gone pretty well in the test side. Um obviously in their first summers, which has been great to see. But I think um, that's something as a squad that we've spoken about since I've returned, um, is that it's all about getting players selected for, for higher honours. Um, so I think that's not, not seeing that as an issue. And, and, you know, the guys that have come in for those for those guys that have been selected for England have come in and, and sort of hit the ground running and played brilliantly. So it's having being prepared for that and then also, um, you know, being able to deal with, with that when it comes and, um, the guys, like I said, that have come in have, have done brilliantly and also great to see to the guys that have been picked for England do, do really well as well. And the ability to bounce back as well. I mean, that was a crushing blow right at the end uh, at Thornton 10 days or so ago and that put Somerset up there. It was a great way to fight back. You then had to go on and win, didn't you? And you did that convincingly in the end. Yeah, I think... I think we've, we feel pretty comfortable playing at the Oval um, with our seam attack and with, with Worrell and um, obviously both the Currens are playing for us this week, which is great as well. So um, playing on quick quick wickets that um, suit us a bit better, I think that was great to be back at, back at home. Um, and yeah, like you say, we've, we've, any time that we've had a poor result, we've bounced back pretty quickly, which has been great. Is, is the championship still the one that the county players, domestic players want to win above all? Obviously the game... Is changing it rapidly, and and the advent of you know short form cricket, franchise cricket, and um, puts particular challenges on scheduling and all all kinds of things. But what's the feeling around the county game? Is it still the championship, the hard grind and graft of the championship that gives the greatest pleasure when you do win it because of all that you have to go through to get there? I think so. I think the, a good parameter of that is obviously there's there's loads of guys in our squad that play franchise cricket and. Um, you know, even in the winter, going away and playing all the T20 leagues, and they always say that when they come back, they, you know, they feel an immense sense of pride, and um, the feeling that you get when you win a four-day game um, is the best of the lot. And and to do that over a long summer, you know, the, the county schedule is obviously challenging, and and to, to be at the top of the tree by the end, I think, you know, like I mentioned there, there's been a few guys that have played at the end. Obviously, Tom and Sam Curran, who who play a lot of T20 cricket now, they they've come back and they sort of speak highly of the feeling that you get when you win a four day game. So it's, I think it is still definitely the, the pinnacle of the county game. And, um, you know, hopefully that can continue. You, you mentioned that it was good to get back to the oval on slightly quicker pitches. That's a bit of a change to how it was. I mean, when Surrey had their first period of dominance, it's long before any of us were born in the fifties, but that was spin dominant Laker and Locke. And then when they won it around the turn of the century, two or three times under Adam Holyoke, Sacklane Mushtak had a big, role to play in that and for, I think for a while Surrey players were frustrated because the pitches were so flat at the Oval it was difficult to force results but you've had a, a definite shift in the last 
two or three years to leave a bit more grass on, make the pitches a bit more challenging, more result orientated. But for you as an opener, that must present some challenges as well. Yeah, I was just about to say that. I think um, coming back to the Oval and then speaking to Dan Lawrence a lot as well, who's obviously joined, I think we both did so how hard it's been batting at the Oval. And uh, we certainly don't mind letting Stu know about that as well. But <laughs> as long as um, as long as we keep winning and um, we get good results, I think we're happy to uh, sacrifice a few runs for um, for some wins. And the flip side, obviously, you need to have a seam attack. And Dan Worrell, I think it's 52 wickets at 16. I mean, he is a serious bowler, isn't he? And do you see him, I think he qualifies for England in April next year. Do you see him in that England side? Does he fit the key mould? Is he, is he quick enough? Is he He's a certainly good, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this week, like genuinely, like standing in the slips with um, with Ben Folks and Dan Lyons, that was one of the quickest spells I've I've seen this season. So he's, he's you know, his skills are there and he's got the pace. And um, I think also as well, like bowling at the Oval sometimes can be quite friendly towards the seamers. But when he's been on the flat pitches with the Kookaburra as well, um, you know, he's been immense for us and. You know, I think anyone in our dressing room can speak highly enough of him as a bloke. And obviously what he produces on the pitch as well is is, is unbelievable. So, look, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sort of, I'm not a selector. I'm, I'm just saying, uh, yeah, he's he's obviously a top bowler and um, hopefully he can keep performing for Surrey. It would be a remarkable story because obviously he has represented Australia. Also, he played three ODIs, I think. I don't think, I can't think of the last person to represent England and Australia would have been, but it would be quite a story if it happens. And there are probably knowing, you know, England supporters, there'd be a bit of backlash it, once he becomes available. If he was picked, it'd probably be a no, bit of not a if he's Not if he gets wickets and helps him win the Ashes, <laughs> there'll be no backlash. <laughs> <can't laughs> <say. laughs> if, if he goes down under and takes a truckload of wickets, he'd probably be pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned Alec uh, earlier. Um, obviously, it's a perfect way for, for him to finish. Just give us an insight into... Um, what Alec has brought to the club. I mean, his work ethic is legendary. Everybody I speak to talks about him being in the gym at, you know, 6.45 every morning or maybe earlier. Um, so there's obviously that work ethic. Much of the success this summer, as you referred to before, is kind of logistical, trying to make sure, you know, you've got the right players available at the right times and good quality overseas players to come in and boost the squad because of all the players you miss for England. What what are his principal... Um, qualities that have helped sorry you know he leaves he leaves the club probably you know top dog on and off the field yeah I think you know in regards to Stewie I'd just say he's you know the way that he deals with people um I look at him on a day-to-day -day basis and the energy that he brings is so consistent so positive and his like knowledge of everyone in the dressing room about their families their situations their partners or whatever you know it's it's something that you don't, it's, I think it's quite rare to see it in, in, the, in the sporting world. Um, I mean, you guys know him as well. I think, you know, that is that is something that he does brilliantly. He works incredibly hard. He does the stuff in the boardroom and he's obviously down there working with folks every day and Smithy on his on their keeping. And um, yeah, I mean, he just brings that work ethic as, along with bats um, to the to the squad. And he's just, yeah, he's, he's, his presence every day with his energy and his positivity is just something that is, is is quite unique, I think. How does that dynamic work? Because in a long time ago when Ath and I played, you know, the captain was the main man in a county dressing room. Occasionally you'd have a coach or whatever, but, um, you know, how does it work with Alec, director of cricket, who knows so much about the game? He is Mr. Surrey. Then you've got Bats, as you said, Gareth Batty. And then you've got, obviously, a, co a captain in Rory Burns, who's now won it four times. And what skills, two-part question, what skills has Rory Burns got to make him such a successful captain? And how does it all fit in? I think those three have a nice blend. I think Stewie, um, you know, although he's, the, he's obviously the, the main man, he doesn't get heavily involved in those conversations on a day-to-day -day basis, if it's in the huddle or around after day's play. And I think that's where Burns' skill comes in. I think between him and Bats, they speak brilliantly to the group. Um, and yeah, I think Bats' work ethic in terms of training is sort of like it's unbelievable. And and Burns is, has got a bit, it can, can be firm. If there's been a bad session here and there, he's got the ability to hand out a spray. So um, I think they just complement each other really nicely. Um, 
and obviously you know we've got we've got a team with a lot of guys that are, have either played or or you know are playing international cricket which i think helps as well so you've got guys that are pretty driven um and i think those three sort of know how to you know they deal with it pretty well i was going to ask that about the squad i mean i think you use 23 players all told in the championship this year and 16 of those have been picked for uh, international cricket in, in various formats and for various countries. So has it been good for you to go back to Surrey? I mean, it must be the closest thing in the county network in terms of, you know, the closest thing to the to an interna- working with an international squad because the quality must be so high. Has, has that been a good thing for you going back there? Yeah, definitely. I think the training sessions and um, you know, within the in the marquee before the season starts, like those some of those sessions are, you know, I'm like, you know, unbelievably tough in terms of they. They remind me of when I was in the COVID bubble, um, having some pretty tough inter-squad games and some, you know, some tough net sessions. So um, I think that can only help. And um, yeah, whether it's playing against guys or playing with guys that are or have played, and then you've got the guys that are younger, the likes of Jamie Smith, Gus, who are wanting to play for England, who are close to it. You know, in a way, it just pushes everyone on and. Um, yeah, it's, it seems it seems to be working well. It's like a nice mix and yeah, of, of sort of youth and, and experience at the same time. Did you always know those two lads would be successful? Seeing Gus Ball and bat at the Oval and obviously Jamie Smith. Did you just look at them around the Oval and said, you know what, I've played Test match cricket. You two are going to be successful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was sort of looking at Smithy, thinking like this guy is the best player I've ever seen in terms of. <laughs> Myself, Burnsy, obviously Popey, Popey and Loz are, you know, I don't want to put myself in the same bracket. I feel a little bit inadequate doing that. Um, but looking at that, like our batting line up for the first six games and seeing Smithy play, I was, yeah, it was incredible. I think everyone was, everyone in our team, you know, around the dressing room was saying like how good he, how good he is and how good he's going to be. And obviously Gus, probably the closest I've seen to, to Joffre in terms of like effortless pace, um, standing at slip to him. Yeah, just can sort of trundle in and and bowl, you know, up to ninety miles per hour. It's, you know, it's a pretty unique skill to have. So I think everyone was pretty confident that they'd go in. Obviously, Test cricket with the with the pressure and the media side of it, you never know. But you know, they've taken it. They've taken it to brilliantly, and, and long may that continue. And, and was that you mentioned about Jamie Smith? There was that this year. You noticed a particular improvement, or you know, has that been over a period of time? Was there something that, that kind of flicked a switch in him at the start of this year? I think last year towards the back end, he played a few knocks and you see him in the nets and you're like, oh, wow, this lad can really play. And then I think especially in the T20 this year, like I, I wasn't in the squad last year and then I started off doing 12th man this year and the way he hit the ball and how far he hit the ball um, on a consistent basis in the games he played before he got picked, it was, you know, it was pretty eye-opening and everyone was... Like you say you're talking about it and you sort of think, oh, this guy's going to not just play test cricket and do well, but he'll probably do all of it really well. Mm. Um, and he's and he's really chilled out guy and you look at him and think, oh, goodness me, like if anyone's going to be able to succeed, uh, succeed in that environment and, and do well with the pressure of test cricket, then he, it's going to be him. So I'm not surprised that he's done well and I'm sure that he's going to continue to do pretty well. What about your game? Dom, uh, we had Alec on right at the start of the season before a ball went down and he noticed in the winter nets definitely more intent from you, uh, much more an aggressive style of batting. Was that a conscious decision because you thought that's what you needed to do to improve your game or was it seeing what they're picking for international cricket and what England need and that's why you've changed your game? Because the strike rate, I've got Benedict Senders, your strike rate has gone up this season. There has been definite more intent What's the reason and thinking behind it? Uh, I think probably, uh, you know, I would be lying if I said that there, there hadn't been a sort of a, you know, seeing the England team go go about it the way they are. But I think also fitted in nicely with me in terms of I really wasn't enjoying cricket a huge amount towards the back end of my test career and then for a little bit after there and, you know, not playing any shots and seeing the way the game's going, not just with the the test side but also with t20 cricket um wanting to pl- having ambitions to play white ball cricket again i just wanted to you know try and expand and first of all sort my technique out and and hopefully hope was hoping that that would help my game and yeah i think that's going in the right direction um and yeah hopefully i can keep building on that 
it's quite interesting there. You talk about, I think your phrase was sorting your technique out. I mean, you went, you've gone through, you know, some changes, haven't you? When we saw you with the England team, I mean, it was quite an unorthodox technique. Your hands quite a long way from your body and, and quite open. And you've gone back to something, I suppose, that's a little bit more textbook or orthodox now. Just talk us through the phases of that and, and how, you know, I think all batters are, are tinkerers to some degree, to a greater or lesser degree, some more than others. But talk to us about those shifts because they're, they're quite significant shifts from your perspective. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one because when I was playing for for England, I didn't. My body was doing something, and I w I wasn't trying to do that. It was just I think a, a result of the pressure and um, playing and not being able to like go back and try and sort. I think it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And I I look back and I see some of the footage and I think, oh word, like what's happened there? It's, Don't worry, we always, we always think back like that as well when we see old highlights. Yeah, it's probably going to blend the stuff, honestly. It's no good. <laughs> and I, um, you know, I look back and I think, goodness gracious, like it's not good that. But um, I think it's just trying to, you know, I, I, when I first got dropped and I was with Warwickshire, I really was like in the nets the whole time trying to like get my hands tighter and trying to do stuff. And I think it it took for me to have a bit of time away from cricket to, to sort of get back to having a, you know, a relatively norm like normal technique i think sometimes when you take time away it's actually more beneficial than um you know getting in the indoor school and putting yourself through it for too long and um yeah i mean it's just one of those things i think you know when i was a kid my technique was pretty normal and as you get higher up and play more and face better bowlers your body starts doing things that you, you can't control and for me it got to a stage where it just yeah needed a bit of a, a reset and um well, i'm not saying it's, it's sorted i need to always keep working on it but i think it's a little bit better now than what it was uh, that's the that's the technical reset what about mentally you mentioned a couple of answers ago you weren't enjoying it you know it, it seems to everyone the dream is to play for your country what was it in the end that you weren't quite enjoying what was getting you down was it the scrutiny was it just the lack of success that you craved what specifically got you down towards the end um i think probably having a taste of like um, you know, the surfing series was obviously great when we, you know, winning at Cape Town and and just like coming out of the COVID bubbles and stuff like that and just having, you know, facing bowlers and thinking like I don't have any options to score, can't hit the ball where I want to hit the ball. And like I said, sort of technically feeling like I'm, you know, all over the shop. I think that was probably just taking its toll a little bit. And yeah, you sort of thinking I need to, yeah, like you say, dream, dream of playing for England and then you get to that stage where you're like, I could do it, doing with the dark clouds coming over here and it to be raining on the morning of a game, which isn't exactly where you want to be. But um, I think that's that's the great thing about cricket, isn't it? Ups and downs. And yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you say that because not everybody has the honesty to admit that. But I think we've all been there where, whether through a bad trot of scores or the technical glitches that you talk about, the scrutiny, the pressure. Um, I think we've all we've all got to the stage where you open the curtains one morning and, and and wish for a dark cloud, which of course people listening to that would think this is utterly ridiculous. You know, it's a great game. You take it up because you enjoy playing it. The dream is is all you know playing for England in front of twenty thousand people, and you, everybody recognises that as well. But it's, in, it's something I think myself and Nas have always tried to not forget and try and have empathy with players because we remember it all too well. We remember the, you know, the the really hard days. And I suppose in the end, that what makes the struggle worthwhile when you come through the other side and, you know, partly talking about the success then again of Surrey this, this year, you must be, you know, enjoying your cricket now, albeit it's at that level below. And so therefore the question is, you know, do you, do you think you can get back into the England team under this regime? Um, and would you approach it differently if you get a got a second crack? Yeah, I mean, so just to yeah answer that, in a, I obviously enjoying the, in my cricket a lot more. And I think, look, I'm. I think before when you when I was like 21, 22, I'm like I want to play for England. That's all I want to achieve with my cricket. Um, from quite a selfish point of view as well. Like I wanted to get my rounds played for England. Now my perspective's changed a little bit. I think, you know, I want to try and 
win trophy, win games of cricket, enjoy it as much as possible. And if that leads to higher honours, um, then that would be amazing. I'd never sort of sit here and say that I didn't want to do it again. Um, I don't crave it as much as I used to because I feel like that leads to like probably the wrong mindset and that desperation to succeed, which I don't think is conducive to, to doing well. But, um, you know, I think that, yeah, that's that's where I'm at mentally now and I'm happy to be a piece of that. I obviously want to be playing white ball cricket, which I've managed to sneak in and do a bit of because um, negotiating the Red Duke on a week-to-week -week basis is tough work. So that's been nice to be playing white ball cricket and want to try and, you know, do some stuff with that. Um, but yeah, I would never, you know, I'd always be keen to, to play for England again. And um, yeah, if it happens, then great. But also I'm not, I'm at peace with, with, it, with, with it not happening. You're, you're at peace, but is there any kind of um, difficult question? I think I know the answer, but any bitterness at all? Because I often see like, you know, someone like Zach Crawley who gets a long, long run. He, he, he has a role. He'll go a long, long time without scores, and then he may get a brilliant hundred. And I often think of the likes of yourself or Rory or Alex Lees, you know, Hamid, Jennings, and they wish they'd had such a long run to show what they could do. Um, do you look at them and think, you know, if I could have just played in this era under McCullum, uh, under Stokes to show what I could do, or do you just see it as a different era completely? Yeah, I see it as different, a different time just because, purely because I didn't play under McCullum and stuff, but I, I played with Stokesy and he captained the test and I always, you know, enjoyed playing with him and found him extremely sort of motivational. And um, I just, yeah, from, from my point of view, I just feel that, I don't have any bitterness f towards it. I think, you know, I played all my test matches in a row and they were gradually getting worse and I was feeling worse about it. And and that's, you know, I'm, I don't have much bitterness towards it and the selectors around that. I think that's something that I'm massively at peace with. And um, yeah, I think that, that means that I can move on and, and keep trying to improve my game and expand it. And if that leads to anything else, then that's great. But yeah, I think there was a little bit of a period where I, I watched test cricket and I was a bit like, oh, I'm struggling to like switch it on and stuff. But now I genuinely sort of tune in as a as a fan again and enjoy seeing people that I, I played with um, and and are playing with at Surrey and seeing them do well and stuff. And yeah, it looks like a great environment to be involved in. And um, yeah, uh, yeah. Sounds like you've, you've got a, a healthy balance at the moment, which is which is a hard place to, to get into, particularly when you're playing, you know, under scrutiny and at the highest level um, all the time. But a, a healthy balance usually leads to some pretty balanced outcomes as well. What about next year for Surrey? The fourth, I mean, is Alec, I know Alec won't be there, but it, is the club environment one of those things where, you know, two mornings after you've, you've, you've won and you're all hung over, they sit you all down and say, a bit like Alex Ferguson used to do with United, right, let's, let, you know, we have to keep striving to get better. Yeah, I think it. I think it will be. Um, I think that will be. If 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 Stewie's got a parting message, that will probably be it. That will be the that will be the um, requirement for next season. I think also we've been to maybe two or three finals days now in a row. I think the club's not won it since the first year that um, it's been. You know, the, the blast has been going on for. So I think obviously the championship success is pretty important. But I think that there are a lot of lads pining to win that trophy as well. So. Yeah. Can I can I just ask you about the state of the game and the schedule? Uh, Af's just come back from Trent Bridge. You know the the rain day, freezing cold, September the twenty third, or wherever we're we're up to. We often ask pundits and broadcasters and journalists and ECB and have their thoughts. We occasionally don't actually ask players. If we ask players about the schedule, where where would you stand? What what needs to change? Is there too much cricket? Not enough cricket? Do you like the stop for the hundred? Having a August completely off. What would you do if you were in charge of English cricket? What would you do? There's a few boys in the dressing room that would have we would have had this conversation. I'll be under a lot of pressure now to say, well, it's been actually. <laughs> what was that? your honest thoughts, Tom? <laughs> um, look, from my point of view, I think um, I, I hear a lot about Championship cricket being taken. I think the Championship and the T20 should should stay. Um, there's, there's, you know, similar to it, similar to what it is at the minute. Um, the 100 is obviously great. I think speaking to the lads that have been involved in and I was involved in it for a short period of time in, in the first summer, I loved it, like, you know, rubbing shoulders with Kane Williamson, 
Um, and I think all the players speak incredibly highly of being in that environment. I think that the issue probably is, from my point of view, is with the how like the 50 over comp is still being made as valuable as possible alongside that, um, because it's still, you know, with with World Cups and Champions Trophies going alongside that, I think it needs to still be made valuable or you make it, you know, something different. Um, but yeah, I mean, see a lot of guy players talking about like, reducing games up from you know county championships where my bread's buttered so I, you know i want to keep it as long as possible and um yeah that's that's my opinion it might be unpopular but um yeah um well it's, it's great to catch up with you dom um thanks for your time um and also great to hear that you know you found a a, a balance which not everybody finds in cricket you've had obviously some success at, at the highest level you may get have, have some more success but you seem to be enjoying your cricket um and have found a nice balance so um congrats again on the on the treble and um good luck for the last game uh, and obviously for the next mighty year. Essex. don't beat the mighty <laughs> Essex. <laughs> no, cheers guys thank you very much for having me well that that was lovely to hear from dom sibley actually nas i thought it was a he gave a lot of honest answers there both not shying away from the fact that cricket is hard and tough at times and the fact that he didn't really enjoy it towards the end of his test career, but also that he's found an accommodation with all that and a nice balance. He seems to be enjoying his cricket again, which, you know, is the most important thing. Yeah, and like you said to him, I think it's sometimes the thing we forget the most when you're out of form, you're out of nick. And these are people, these are persons, they have to go back to family and they, you know, it's their career. They've lived all their life to, to be on the biggest stage and you're not getting runs and you're getting your game and your technique pulled to pieces and you're going back to your hotel room. Listen, I've been there probably more than you. I don't know if you hit it better than me, but I have w w nearly everything he said there about technique, but more importantly, the mental side resonated with me i literally why do you think i'm so good with the weather now it's because <laughs> i used to watch every weather forecast and i did open my curtains at times uh, not so much as captain and that's what i loved about the captaincy i saw the bigger picture but definitely as a player i used to open up my hotel curtains and go please be raining i've got to go and try and prove i'm a an england batter again you know under the biggest spotlight and i think that's where we've just got to be careful um and I, and I like your piece you did this week because I was thinking of tweeting something about it. You know, the, the, the stick Ollie Pope cop for going yeah. off and playing in Wentworth and having having a life outside of cricket. These guys are under pressure so much. You know, he captained England for three tests. He played all summer. The cricket they've got ahead, the schedule is so bad, so much in it that if you can have a little bit of time to have your own time, your own space to clear your head, Sibber's spoke about it there that's what he you know, said just, didn't he he said actually that that's yeah. what helped his batting getting away yeah. from the yeah. game rather than going back to the nets and that would that would no doubt remin a little bit reminiscent of jonathan trott as well who went through that yeah. period of burning in 2003 was he all right were you, were you okay calling him the vicar by the way he was <laughs> i think so i think he brought a smile to his face but <laughs> um yeah he got away and and he's found you know he's I think you, you, the, the, one of the things about sport, isn't it, that wisdom can come late and knowledge and, and all the things that you learn about yourself and the game, by the time you learn them all and you've got all that knowledge and wisdom, it's often then at the end of your career when you're too old to, yeah. to work it all out. But he's not. He's got a few years ahead of him. So it sounds like he's come to and found that balance at a nice time and he'll you know, hopefully enjoy the last, latter third or, you know, however many years he's got left. Um, and, you know, fingers crossed he can find a lot of success as well and challenge for England honours again. Well, what about the last question I asked him? And in general, just to tie in the whole of this week's podcast about domestic cricket and, and the schedule and also what the Lancashire CEO has spoken about in your paper today about he fears for the game and he fears for the Red Bull game you know, that people will, will, will go off into a franchise sunset even in that and, and see it as almost like a feeder for that. And he's having to pay him more and more to entice him to play championship cricket and Red Bull cricket. We've just had Dom on who, who loves Red Bull cricket and we love Red Bull cricket. Do you see that as a threat or a fear or is it something specific for Lancashire? Sorry, seemed to cope okay with it. Yeah, I, I do 
I do. I mean, I've been banging on about it forever, really, that, that once the game is driven by market forces alone, then players will take the options that the market affords them. Now, Dom Sibley is a player who at the moment doesn't have necessarily those options in franchise cricket. He may get to that stage, who knows, but he doesn't right now. So the market is a pretty simple one for him. But for players who do have options, uh, you know, who are who maybe have started in first class cricket, but have white ball aspirations and ambitions and, and white ball qualities, the market suddenly becomes very skewed because you can earn, as the Lancashire CEO was saying today, lots of money in franchise cricket. And franchise cricket is often taking place. IPL takes place at the start of the championship season. CPL uh, is taking place right now towards the end of the championship season. Um, so once the game is, is is dominated by the market, the players will make those choices according to what the market offers them. So unless you regulate the market, then I'm, I, I fear for it as well. Um, and I mean, I, that, yeah, I, I I agree with all that. The only thing I'd say about us now, and I've seen it with a lot of people, and I've seen it today with what you've had to do, and the the final being pushed back so late, is that. We need solutions now. We're getting, it's like a coach. I always say a, a good coach will tell you what you're doing wrong. A great coach will tell you how to correct it. I think good. Sure, no, I, I take that, but I think, it, I think it's too late in the day. How do we, how do we solve it? I, I think it's too late in the day. I mean, these come, the warnings were there 15 years ago. Um, and the conversations should have been happening then, 15, 10 years ago. Not now. It's too late. The game is too far down a road, in my view, and I don't see it. I don't see an easy solution at all. So I offer no easy solutions because I don't have them. I'm just regretful that you know a lot of the warning signs. Are from we? 10 are we just too? Are we just too old fogies that you know we've had Test cricket this week? Anyone watching that India Bangladesh game? All those India fans will say Test cricket and cricket's in a healthy place. Sri Lanka winning at home against New Zealand. We've had a pretty good test summer. You know, others would say, you you know, other sports would say you're lucky that people want so much. People, you, your problem is because people want cricket all, all year round and so many different formats. What are you complaining about? You know, cricket is in a healthy place. What would you say to that? Well, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a pessimist about the game. I think the game will always be watched. It's just that, once the market skews the game, then I think certain elements of the game will come under pressure. We see it in England now. The 50-over game is under under significant pressure. Um, and Test cricket will be because, you know, the West Indies team that we had here this year, you know, they're missing players that might, could be in their team were they not engaged in other cricket elsewhere. So it's not a pessimism around the game. It's just a... It's just an, a, an awareness and an acknowledgement of the direction of the game. And what frustrates me is that players and administrators often bang the drum and say, test cricket's the pinnacle. But, you know, all the actions that are taken make it hard for that to be the case. Um, so the direction of travel if, if is you were, if, 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 if you were the decision maker in world cricket and I came to you and said, here is the solution. Just play test cricket and T20 cricket and nothing else. What would you say? Well, I, I thought that that was going to be the obvious outcome once, you know, IPL and, and franchise cricket and T20 cricket kind of erupted, if you like. But I suppose the problem is the more gap, if you create gaps in the calendar, then more franchise competitions will pop up. Yeah. The market is very yeah. hard to control. Once once the free market is there, it's very hard to control. So I really don't have any easy solutions um, other than, you know, a regret that the chance to regulate things earlier on was not taken and seized. Anyway, we'll you've got to have, get to We'll have to have someone come on. <laughs> yes. Think of a good guest who can provide all the solutions. Maybe we'll have yeah. somebody from the World, yeah. World Cricketers Association because they're going through this yeah. 
these conversations right now. Maybe we'll have somebody from uh, what used to be called FICA on um, to tell us what should be right. done. Anyway, you've got to get to Peterborough to get the train up to Durham. Peterborough, Peterborough Station to get to Durham without my daughter. Great. Thank you. Without your daughter. Uh, enjoy Durham tomorrow. I hope it's absolutely freezing and about six degrees. <laughs> 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 um, I hope actually for the Durham Club, a great bunch of guys. I hope they have a, a very successful day. You always get a friendly welcome up there. I hope it's a, a sellout and a good game. Um, and we will convene after the last ODI at Bristol and maybe round up the season after the last championship fixture.